Well, I, I was born in Morristown, New Jersey in 1961 and uh, attended public school there. And uh, during that period of my youth in New Jersey, roughly from 1967-68 to 1972, I was a child participant in DARPA's Project Pegasus, which was the U.S. time-space program at the time of its emergence. There was an actual time travel program that emerged secretly in the defense technical community at that time. Um, we moved to Southern California in 1972. Uh, I attended uh, high school at Chatsworth High School in the San Fernando Valley, went on to UCLA, uh, and then actually went on to earn six post-secondary degrees, two at UCLA, one of which I reported, which was a BA in history. I, I was secretly earning a BS in advanced mathematics under a naval postgraduate school program in the evenings that we were sort of just auditing and we got credit for, but then ultimately I didn't declare as a degree. Um, I stayed in Los Angeles after college. I worked for several years with Norman Cousins on a comprehensive uh, oral history of Norman's writings and career at the Saturday Review and his, his work for Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. Um, and while writing um, articles about uh, urban environmental policy for the Cousteau Society, uh, I then went on to earn a Juris Doctor and a Certificate in Environmental and Natural Resources Law at the nation's oldest and most comprehensive environmental law program, which is at uh, Northwestern School of Law, Lewis and Clark College um, in Portland, Oregon. Went back to uh, Southern California, um, earned a, a second um, post-secondary, you know, advanced credential, namely a a Master of City and Regional Planning with Distinction at Cal Poly SLO. I, I worked on some urban planning projects in San Diego County and in San Luis Obispo County. And as a result of that work, um, I was urged by some individuals in California, or invited really, to go over to the University of Cambridge in England and pursue an MPhil in land economy, which is the British Environmental Affairs Discipline. And there, uh, my department chair and personal advisor was uh, Professor Malcolm Grant, who was the chair of the department. Today, Malcolm is the president and provost of University College London. Uh, and I began publishing papers about sustainability at the international peer-reviewed level when I was at Cambridge. Came back to the United States, passed the Washington State Bar um, in 1996, and I've been in solo practice ever since. Um, and so I have a lot to give away. I mean, I was really sort of developing professionally and academically from roughly age 17 into my early 30s, um, working my way through different academic programs, uh, developing my writing uh, skills, my, my understanding of global environmental problems. But then as I was practicing law, and I had really kind of gotten away from my concern about sort of, you know, making the rescue of the environment the central organizing principles of civilization, as, as Al Gore stated in, in Earth in the, in the Balance, I realized that a set of experiences that I had in childhood may, may have been very germane um, to addressing the problem of, of environment and development that we find ourselves in. And namely, I, I realized that as I went back and I began to revisit my childhood experiences in Project Pegasus when I was in my late 30s, that a revolutionary form of transport had been introduced that we should be using to link people all over the world. I mean, by 1970, the very time that Al Gore was sitting in Roger Revelle's uh, uh, what was it? It wasn't a climate change symposium. It would have been a, a greenhouse effect seminar right there at, at Harvard. A, a technology had emerged secretly in the U.S. defense community that could have been used since 1970 to obviate most of the uh, pollutants that enter our global atmosphere as a result of transportation, which is a major part of, uh, of climate change and the threat that humans are posing uh, to, the, to the possibility that we're shifting the climate in a negative way. So in around 2000, after I'd been practicing law for three or four years, I began to spend my time during my quiet hours away from my, my law practice going back and revisiting what happened to me in Project Pegasus. And I've been taking that investigation forward for 10 years now, 10, 11 years. Um, I, I've gone from essentially um, trying to explain to my siblings and oldest and dearest friends what happened to me and how far out it was all the way now to doing mainstream television about my experiences. I'm recently, um, I filmed an episode of Conspiracy Theory with Governor Jesse Ventura. You know, and it was a big thrill for me to go to Santa Fe, where we were teleporting from New Jersey when I was a child, 
and explain to somebody who had been the governor of a major state and somebody who's been spoken of as a potential presidential candidate, you know, about my experiences uh, essentially involved in time travel research and development for the U.S. defense technical community. Now, along the way, I basically, I've gotten into a very contentious public controversy as to whether I'm lying or crazy or telling the truth and provoking the envy of other people, because those were the three outcomes that we were told when we were children on the project would result if we shared our secret experiences with others. So I'm now doing that as an adult. I've made it my life's quest to push for the adoption globally of teleportation, because that's going to do a lot not only to address our environmental problems, but it's going to bring the world together. We're going to have to rely on each other rather than standing off and worrying about whether we're going to be warring against each other. So I see the emergence um, of teleportation globally as a very positive thing, and that's really become the thrust of my of the truth campaign I've, I've launched um, to make the, the global polity aware of the fact that a revolutionary form of transportation emerged secretly in the United States government over 40 years ago, and we have to pressure the United States government to declassify that technology and deploy it globally. We may, in fact, need to do so to achieve planetary sustainability. So that's essentially been the thrust of my, my truth campaign activities related to, to Project Pegasus. Along the way, I stumbled into a set of activities that I had completely repressed. And I think Brett Stillings, who's going to be your second guest tonight, can confirm that when we entered training to go to Mars via one of the forms of time travel that had been developed by Project Pegasus, namely the jump room, we were involved in our, our Mars visitation experiences and essentially lived for several years a set of very harrowing experiences. But because of the brainwashing that occurred at that time, we didn't, those experiences really didn't occupy our thoughts for the next 30 years, you know, roughly from, let's say, when they ended around 1982-83 to the present. So what ended up happening is after I appeared the first time on Coast to Coast AM as a guest on November 11th of 09, two or three months later, William Stillings, one of the individuals who was in my Mars training class in the summer of 1980 uh, and who had been on the surface several times with me, uh, and could identify me, contacted me at my home here in Vancouver, Washington. And for the past year and a half or so, Brett and I have been comparing notes about our Mars experiences and our understanding of what happened relative to Marsgate, this cover-up of the fact that time travel was being used by 1980 to place American personnel on Mars, um, is now very advanced. I mean, we've spent many hours in conversation and have recovered a lot, so hopefully we'll be able to share some of that with you tonight. I love it. I mean, this is this is really huge. I I, I want us to um, some of the people may not be um, aware of your um, two uh, shows that you did on uh, Coast to Coast with uh, with George Nori, and um, so I, I just want to make sure that people have enough background, Andy, about um, Project Pegasus and um, how you were brought in to the CIA's Mars Visitation Program. And just to kind of give a little more foundation before we move into more of the details. Right. Well, Project Pegasus was a, was a, was a classified research and development project. It had two major emphases. One, they were training us on um, teleporting th through vortal tunnels in time space via a Tesla teleporter, which was essentially... They were two parentheses-shaped objects that were sort of complementary on the concave side, kind of like elephant tusks. And between these two devices, um, there was a field of radiant energy that Tesla had found a way to tap from the universe so that when you jumped through it, you opened up essentially a tunnel in time space. And when that tunnel lost its inertia, you basically popped into view somewhere else in the time-space continuum, namely on Earth in real time, but then gradually, as I was in the project for several years, really by fall of 1970, um, they were actually adjusting our position in time using that device. So I had my first jump sometime between 1967 and 68 with my late father, Raymond F. Bishago, who was um, a special projects engineer for the Ralph M. Parsons Company, which is one of the world's largest engineering companies and a major defense contractor for the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, we arrived via teleportation in Santa Fe from the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey. 
And from there, we drove into a meeting with Dr. Harold M. Agnew when he was the director of the W Division, which is the weapons division at the Los Alamos National Labs. And it was during that conversation that Dr. Agnew asked my late father my age. And my, my dad and I both said six. And so from that, we can date that first teleportation, or at least the first one that I can remember, and that meeting to sometime between September of 67 and 68, because I was born in September of 61. Uh, and it was during that conversation in which my dad said, have you tried it yet, namely the teleporter? And Agnew said, no, but I want to. And if you consider the fact that Agnew was a major Defense Department insider, I mean, he was the only Manhattan Project physicist who had been present at all three critical stages of the Manhattan Project. He had been at CP1 when the atomic pile went critical in the squash courts um, at the University of Chicago as one of the graduate students of Enrico Fermi, who was assisting the Manhattan Project. He was in um, Los Alamos and Alamogordo, New Mexico, when the atomic bomb was designed and tested. And he actually calibrated the magnitude of the atomic blast above Hiroshima uh, while, while um, located in the Great Artiste, which was the chase plane that was following the Enola Gay after it dropped the, uh, the bomb on, on Hiroshima, Japan. So my father and Agnew had a discussion that convinced me, especially retrospectively, now when I can look back as an adult and appreciate how historic that meeting was, that operational teleportation had just emerged in the defense technical community such that somebody as, as connected as Agnew had, was planning on trying it but had not yet gotten around to doing so. So I think my father took me on that jump because he wanted to show Agnew that if teleportation was safe for his six-year-old, that it would be safe for anybody's child. <laughs> because my dad believed that teleportation should be used to advantage humanity, to become a new form of transportation that would be a lot less dangerous, cheaper, faster, more convenient, less fatiguing, less energy intensive, less environmentally destructive. And I'm continuing that work because the U.S. is in possession of this technology, and I believe that we should launch a new Manhattan Project to go back and recapture the technology and implement it. We should be leading the world in, in implementing new energy technology, not in sponsoring wars of foreign adventurism on behalf of oil companies. Okay, so I'm trying to bring my dad's belief that, of the civilian potential of this technology forward in time and see that it's implemented during my lifetime. Uh, the second major emphasis of Project Pegasus were electro-optical devices called chronovisors that had been discovered by two Vatican priests named Ernetti and Gemelli when they were studying the harmonic patterns in Gregorian chants at the Catholic University of Milan in the 1940s. And they ultimately partnered with the great Italian physicist, Dr. Enrico Fermi. And by 1952, they were able to capture flat screens or television-like images of past events. When I was being trained in Project Pegasus, the first image of that kind that I was shown was an actual image of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. And the technician actually pointed to George Washington on the dais and Benjamin Franklin sitting on a, a sofa in front of the dais at the Constitutional Convention on September 17, 1787, I believe at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> when the Constitution was signed. That's what we were looking at on this TV screen. So really, that, those were the two major time travel technologies that uh, I was exposed to in Project Pegasus. The paradox was, by the time I was exposed to Chronovision, it, it had gone from being a flat screen technology to a three-dimensional cube of light, a kind of a hologram being generated by a crystal array in the ceiling. The hologram was being generated by driving an electromagnetic signal through an octagonal array of bismuth crystals. And that created a field of supercharged particles that was so dense that the chronovisors actually work by capturing a non-local event and bringing it into the laboratory. Well, what they found when somebody was standing on the stage and the chronovisors, you know, the hologram propagated by the hologram was tuned in around them, is that that person was suddenly transported to whatever past or future event the chronovisor was tuning in. So a major part of my experience in Project Pegasus was being essentially displaced in time so that I was directly experiencing events in the past and future as if I had been in them originally. But as uh, uh, Jack Pruitt explained to us when he trained us on the chronovisor at Morristown, New Jersey, we were ultimately only a spectral presence in those quantum environments, like he said, like a ghost is in our environment. 
So I was both, basically both physically time traveling through vortal tunnels, and I was also being immersed in these holograms in which I was in a very advanced uh, virtual reality that was the recapitulation of a past event or the, the pre-experiencing of a future event by which I could then tell the program sponsors what I saw and what I experienced uh, when I was time traveling. Um, one of the limits, obviously, of the teleporters is they couldn't tell us, teleport us back in time before the emergence of teleportation or we would have been lost in time, right, which was a very fearsome prospect for a New Jersey school child who was watching Lost in Space uh, during the afternoons after school. So <laughs> they introduced the chronovision to allow us to essentially eavesdrop on non-local locations but not be stranded there, as we would have been if we had teleported there. There were a couple other technologies. The Montauk chair was being used to bump us forward so that we pre-experienced our own futures as if we were actually living them. Uh, there was a, a, an emergent technology called um, uh, um, uh, what is, um, plasma confinement where we were placed inside of a, a lucite chamber and we would walk into this field of plasma and then drop through a set of wormholes to a past event and then the effect would wear off and we would find ourselves back in the laboratory. So I was really, on one level, I was an experimentee because they wanted to gather information, for example, on the effects of teleportation on bright, healthy American kids. Um, we were ne necessities in the sense that the, the holograms that the chronovisor uh, would propagate would collapse if an adult was used as the chronovisee. Um, we were also clearly participant observers in the time travel research that was being performed, or let's say the, the research into what was in these other timelines, because children were viewed as very keen observers of, of novel events. So we were clearly, um, you know, sort of viewees, as, as I sometimes say in my lectures. We were being relied upon because we were tabula rasa. We were blank slates who would perceive more accurately uh, the timelines that we were being sent to. And we were also clearly trainees because we were told, and I overheard some conversations between my late father and Donald Rumsfeld, who was the uh, defense attache to the project, that ultimately we would be sent on to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, and that would be used as a pretext to involve us in future project activities. Well, I was invited to go there, but I declined. And so really what we're going to be talking about tonight is what happened during my college years as a civilian, uh, not as a plea, but the Naval Academy, in which the time-space program had kind of readjusted its focus 10 years running, not on developing time travel, but on using one of the time travel devices to place American personnel on Mars. And that's really where we pick up in 1980. I love it. So, I mean, this is just, it gets my head spinning a little bit, of course. But let let's go into... You know, your preparation for Mars, um, you know, who was involved at that time? I mean, we're talking about, you know, 30 years ago since you went to Mars and, and, and what the process has been that has allowed this information to come to the surface because obviously they probably didn't really want you to remember all this. Am I right about that? Well, I had remembered all of my childhood experiences in Project Pegasus because I actually resisted the brainwashing and I was even telling my junior high, high school, and college, and even my law school classmates about some of my experiences in Project Pegasus from, let's say, you know, 1967, 68 to 72, actually to 73, because we were quantum displaced into 73 at one point. Uh, so I was completely in mastery of those facts, and I would always think about them, and that's really why I started writing down my memories in around 2000. But I was completely blocked about what took place from 1980 to 83 when I was at UCLA as an undergraduate. This, for me, would have been, let's say, age 18 to 22. Uh, what happened was that in the summer of 1980, my father approached, approached me in our home in Chatsworth, California, and said, son, uh, we're going to be going on a camping trip. And I said, oh, is, is, I asked one whether my mom and my next eldest brother was going to be going with us, as they both had during several previous summers. Um, and he said, no, it's just going to be you and your dad. And I said, oh, really, dad, where are we going? And he said, the Shasta area. We're going to camp on the shores of Lake Siskiyou. So we loaded up the boat, and with our tent and everything, and on the morning, we, um, we drove up to um, Lake Siskiyou. 
Are you still there, Dr. Jones? Yep, I'm still. We had a got, little got, bit of a glitch, got, but um, they're, yeah, they got to do better than that. Right, okay. And uh, so, but before reaching the lake, you know, to, and to, to pitch our tent, he stopped at uh, at exit 745, which is the McLeod exit. That's, that's, uh, that's two exits on I-5 south of the College of the Siskiyous. And he went into the McLeod market, which is still there. But before he went into the market, he said, Andy, just do me a favor. Stay in the car. You know, unless the car blows up, just try to stay in the car. Whatever happens, I'll be out in 15 minutes. So he came out of the store in 15 or 20 minutes. I was still there. I had stayed in the car, even though it was getting kind of hot inside the car. And something strange had occurred. He, had, he now had about a, a five-day growth of beard. Now, I said, Dad, what happened? You, now you have a beard. And he said, oh, I, you know, son, I always let my beard grow when we're camping. But that's not what happened. What happened, he went from clean shaving when we left Chatsworth that morning, and we're now in, we, you know, in, in McLeod, California, late afternoon, and he comes out of the market with more than a 5 o'clock shadow. It was like a four- or five-day growth of beard. Curiously, at the same time, the same day, William Stillings, who was the son not of a Parsons engineer, but of an operations analyst for Lockheed Corporation, the Lockheed Skunk Works, in Burbank, California, was having an identical experience. His father explained how they were going to go camping as, as father and son. He drove Brett up to McLeod, right within eyeshot there of, of beautiful Mount Shasta, went in, actually, actually Brett says he shaved before he went in, and then came out with like a two- or three-day growth of beard. So somewhere there, our fathers somehow were time-looped where they had spent days in quantum displacement. I think they were getting kind of a pre-lecture for that summer's activities. Because they then drove us separately over to the campground on the north shore of Lake Siskiyou. <coughs> and the first strange thing ha that happened, I've already narrated on radio. Basically, uh, Tom Stillings, Brett's father, took out a slab of metal and said, watch this, Andy. And he said to my father, I don't have to show this to you, Ray, because you work with this. And he basically took this slab of metal, about the size of a, of a chalk eraser, you know, from an elementary school and it hovered over the ground. In other words, it had an anti-gravitic effect, a reverse magnetic effect. So then we, you know, we just spent some time around the campfire that night. We got up the next morning, and promptly at 1 p.m. the next morning, which was our first Sunday there that weekend, my father and Brett's father got up and began just without any explanation walking across the campgrounds. And they went up the road there, we were sort of close to the lake, but they went up the road where there were individual campsites, and they took us into sort of the third campsite on the left, and a man met us between his car and his camper at the front of his campsite. And Brett can confirm, because Brett had a relationship with this individual for the next decade, astronaut Edwin A. Aldrin, namely Buzz Aldrin, greeted us between the two cars and said something that Brett and I didn't understand. He said something like, Boys, it looks like you're going to be experiencing what I experienced a few years back, and that's going off planet. Well, let me tell you, it's going to be the experience of a lifetime. You're going to love it. And Brett kind of, and I kind of looked at each other like, you know, what is Buzz talking about? This is clearly, you know, one of the heroes of my youth as, as the son of an aerospace engineer. I was just locked into Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. I mean, I had, I had posters of astronaut, astronauts on my bedroom wall. And so I just kind of exchanged pleasantries with astronaut Aldrin. I think I said... I've met your daughter because Buzz Aldrin's daughter, Jan, had sung the 12th of Never at my, one of my elder sister's weddings in June of 1980. And we just engaged in some chit-chat with, with Buzz and walked back to our campsite. That night, around 10 p.m., we're sitting around the campfire, my dad and, my, and, and I and, and Tom Stillings and, and Brett, and my father just looked at me and said, and, and over at Brett and said, boys, you're going to be taking some classes tomorrow. And, it, you know, it being my, my father, I looked at my dad across the campfire and said, Dad, what are you talking about? I thought we were going to have some fun this summer. You know, this is such a great area of the country. I mean, I, you know, what are you talking about? I just spent a year in college. And he said, well, I'm sorry, Andy, but that's what's going to happen. Tomorrow we're going to get up and we're going to take you up to the college. And I said, what college? And he said, College of the Siskiyous, which is in Wheat. Promptly that next morning at about 7.30, we left in separate cars into a um, a classroom at the College of the Siskiyous that, well, actually, before we went up to the college, we went up to an alternate campus for College of the Siskiyous that's farther up the freeway, 
and we had kind of an indoctrination session by an army officer who was trying to scare the hell out of us to keep what we were going to be experiencing secret. But then either that morning or the next morning, we were, we were taken up to College of the Siskiyous, you know, and we were in an academic setting per se. There were 10 teenagers, late teenagers. Brett was actually uh, 13, so he was sort of the young uh, individual in our group. It was mostly nine individuals around my age, maybe a little bit older or younger, 10 in all, and we've identified five of them. In addition to Brett and I, the three other students who we positively identified by reconstructing our memories was a young African-American man from Hawaii who had just spent a year at Occidental College in Eagle Rock, California, near Pasadena, named Barry Satoro. I know that this individual told me that his name was Satoro because the second time I talked to him walking into the classroom in the morning, I asked him his name, and he said, Barry, and I said, Barry what? And he said, Barry Satoro. And I said, oh, our names kind of have a similar cadence. Mine is Andy Bashago, and I introduced myself, you know, formally. We've been in class together. This individual had also made a very intelligent observation to me one time when we were walking out of class that we were being trained to do something that most people who had ever lived had never experienced on Earth, namely visiting another planet. And I said, you know, you're right. It really is that, that far out. I'm having difficulty processing what they're training us for. The two other individuals, one was on my far left, and he, was, he audited the class for about a week, and he didn't stay for the full three weeks. And Brett and I have been identified that individual as William Cameron McCool, who was the pilot of the Columbia and tragically died with his fellow astronauts when the Columbia Space Shuttle was entering the Earth's atmosphere. We know it was Willie McCool because after telling us that he, he was Willie McCool and that he had just spent a year at the Naval Academy, as I was supposed to as one of the children in Project Pegasus, he had just spent a year as a plebe at Annapolis and survived it. But he said, all you really have to know about me is that I'm cool. So just remember that that's my name. <laughs> and we didn't forget that because that was an unusual thing for a, an 18-year-old to say about himself. Now, the sole female among our peers in the class and somebody we also can identify was somebody who had just spent a year at Caltech in Pasadena, California, one, you know, one of the <clears throat> most academically challenging uh, undergraduate programs in the country, entering a Ph.D. course of study at 16, and that was Regina E. Dugan, who Barry Satora, who would later become Barack Obama, appointed the 19th director and first female director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency on July 20th of 2009, the 40th anniversary of the lunar landing. Regina was in class with us, and she was in some of the jumps to Mars that ultimately resulted, as was Barack Obama. So what, what Brett and I um, have shared with, with the American people beginning um, on November 10th of this year is the story of our training experience and the fact that we were not only being placed on the surface of Mars, but that two very highly placed executive branch officials were among our contemporaries who were enrolled in that training program and were on the surface when our, our particular missions on Mars would overlap. In other words, we, we had experiences where both of them were on the surface with us. It's it's just I mean this this is this is huge Andy and um, your your memory and the details of this I I just have a tremendous amount of respect for because it's it's the the, the clarity of what you're sharing now you you've been on coast to coast with this you, this information hasn't been held back we've seen it on the exopolitics side and everything else um, have other people come forward. To validate this, now you don't hold back. Also, from naming people, what what about no. those people? Because those people, in addition to Barack Obama, they're still around. Well, two people have come forth since we made our announcement, which is a true announcement. And believe me, as somebody who spent as many years in the academic vineyards as I did, and I've really essentially been self-employed my entire adult life, um, and I'm self-employed today as an attorney, so I don't really have that much of, a, of an economic safety net below me. So I was really risking my, my credibility as a journalist and, a, and, and as a, more, more importantly as a, as a lawyer because that's my, that's my livelihood. We're not lying, but there were really three individuals who came forth in and around our announcement in November. Several days 
before our announcement, President Obama made an official statement as president that the United States government has never had contact with extraterrestrials and it has no knowledge of extraterrestrial life. He did so as somebody who has been on Mars and interacted with Martian humanoids and animals, just as we did. Okay. The second person who came forward uh, came forward and called in and kind of a setup when I was on coast, and that was our instructor at College of the Siskiyous in the summer of 1980. Major Ed Dames, the remote viewing pioneer. Ed called in, tried to suggest that my memories, while highly integrated, um, were from um, a set of parallel reality experiences. Then he began establishing his own bona fides by saying that he had been serving his country in Germany on the Czech border with the electronic warfare program of the U.S. Army at that time. And then when I held up, and it was clear to him I wasn't going to be intimidated into silence, you may recall that he launched into a set of pejoratives against me that I was, that I had been harassing him when in fact I've only sent him two emails during my 11-year investigation. Um, he stated that I had sick fantasies, that I was like a lot of people who contact him. In fact, I was one of his former colleagues and a young unpaid one at that. So that was the second person who came forward. My position, and I know Brett shares this, is that we have only saluted Ed Dames as our instructor, as somebody who trained us so well that we survived on the surface of Mars. We've never engaged in any kind of disparagement of him as our instructor and, and, a, and, a, and a colleague from the CIA's Mars Visitation Program. We think that just as we're proud of what we did for our country, he should be too, and we're calling on him to break his silence and acknowledge that he was in this program. The third individual contacted me just a few weeks ago, and he, he remains nameless. He was an assistant to President Nixon in the early 70s who was tra tracking Project Pegasus and then the Mars program through 1982. I'm going to be trying to talk him into, I'm going to try to talk him into coming forward and revealing his identity. Uh, what this individual is claiming is that we weren't visiting Mars per se, but sort of pocket or micro universes that the jump room technology was capable of accessing. So that counter argument to our belief regarding what we were trained in and what we did, I mean, we were in a Mars training program, but what this person is alleging is that ultimately the program discovered that we weren't visiting Mars, but we were really visiting essentially a parallel reality where a kind of a virtual reality of a Martian environment existed. So I'm presently researching this person's claims. I've had a lot of uh, Skype time with him over the last several weeks, and ultimately I hope to either bring his story or maybe even his identity forward. But he was basically a kind of an ad hoc investigator for President Nixon who stayed on in different defense, or excuse me, intelligence capacities, and it's his position that I really wasn't remembering a critical event that happened in the Mars program that indicated that it wasn't Mars in real time, but it was a synthetic Mars that the device was capable of accessing, either because it existed organically in the universe or it had been sort of architected uh, in kind of a solid state basis, kind of in a holodeck by, for example, the extraterrestrials known as the Greys. So we have a really important informant who stepped forward. I recognize him by face and name. I know he's somebody that I had contact with in the Mars program, but I'm still investigating what he's claiming because, he, because he's really presenting a different theory, a different hypothesis as to what we were doing. So ultimately, because I'm dedicated to the truth, not to valorizing what I or Brett or Laura have done or other people in the program have done, but simply because it was my goal from the beginning to go back and find the truth of what happened on these projects, I'm going to be working very closely with this individual to try to see if he can substantiate his hypothesis that that's in fact what was happening. Now, at this point in time, we were trained for Mars and we went to a place that we believed was Mars and it was clearly an alien environment. It was, a, it was an alternate terrestrial realm. So right now, it's our position that we were visiting Mars, but we're going to be open-minded and really explore what this very important informant has to say. Now, uh, Andy, I know you mentioned uh, the jump room, and I'm really curious about what you mean by this jump room. Where was the jump room that you used to get to Mars located, um, and can you describe for us how it worked? Yes. Certainly, Ilya. Um, 
there's a building at 999 North Sepulveda Boulevard at the corner of North Sepulveda and Imperial Avenue East and West that's immediately south of Los Angeles International Airport. In the early 80s, it was owned by Hughes Aircraft. It wasn't the Hughes headquarters in El Segundo. It was another building. And the jump room was the elevator in the center of that building. What would happen is we would enter the lobby, go up the elevator to the fifth floor, and as Brett and I have compared notes very recently, we would give our name and then sign our full name and provide our Social Security number and our date of birth. We would then be asked to go back into the elevator. The elevator would go up to the eighth floor. And then from there, after the lights began blinking at the top and the bottom of the elevator, about five minutes into the jump to Mars, which is where we had been trained to go. In fact, we initially went with respirators on hand to see if we could, not, you know, if we needed them to breathe in the Martian atmosphere or the atmosphere of whatever, you know, recapitulation of Mars we were visiting on some uh, quantum reality type basis, some parallel reality basis. And um, about five minutes into the journey, the the box-like elevator would begin morphing into um, a cylinder. So the ceiling would rotate onto the horizontal, and we had to kind of right ourselves. We had to kind of scramble and try to right ourselves as we found ourselves ultimately in a cylinder. And when the cylinder reached full cylinder, and the, and the ceiling is now the end of the cylinder, and it's kind of swirling and kind of like a wormhole pattern, there was tremendous pressure on us physically and also mentally, because whatever the jump room was doing to our environment was also doing to our brain chemistry. So there was this sort of discombobulating kind of tension or a kind of a torsional effect in the brain that we ultimately had to adjust to as, as people using this, this particular uh, form of technology to go somewhere. And then it would, about, after about 10 minutes of that, the twisting would abate and the jump room would morph from a cylinder back into a box. And then after it was a box for about five minutes, it would open and we were, on, we were in the jump room facility on Mars. There were actually three or four that we can remember. I know I was in one that Brett wasn't in, but he also remembers two or three that I was in. So there were different locations uh, on Mars or in this uh, synthetic uh, parallel reality, if you will. You know, again, our position right now is that it's Mars. And um, we would e exit the door, walk out, and walk either on, through steps or kind of a rampart at one of the facilities onto the surface. Mars had or has essentially a rust red terrain with a very beautiful light blue sky which is something I've been saying since I began my truth campaign, and now we're, we, we have examples of, of accurate um, photographs of Mars that show that that's what it looks like. Um, so essentially we would then be involved in different activities on the surface and then go back to the jump room, and that process would repeat itself, and the door would open, and uh, we were back at, at 999 North Sepulveda wow. in El Segundo, I'm California. How incredibly, you know, outrageous to have these experiences. Um, now, tell me, based on, I mean, I've got so many other questions, and, and time being what time is, I'm just kind of dealing with getting everything in. Um, is, in, in, from, from your knowledge and everything, what do you believe is happening on Mars now? Well, I mean, if you factor in that other whistleblowers have affirmed the jump room narrative that Brett and I are, uh, you know, are sharing, namely Michael Relf and Arthur Neumann, who was known as the Henry Deacon informant to Project Camelot. And if you consider the fact that 25 years after we were going up there via jump room, uh, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower and her two twin sons were invited to go up there to join a Mars colony. And if you realize that the jump room technology was getting people there so effectively, really in 20 minutes. I mean, I've said, you know, publicly that it was easier to take the jump room from El Segundo to Mars than to take the red eye from Los Angeles to New York on a Friday night. I mean, it was relatively <laughs> convenient once you got used to the, to the brain-twisting uh, effects of the torsional field that we were in. Um, I would think that, you know, add in 25 years, um, add in the trillions of dollars of funding that have been spent on, on these black projects, add in the account of, of uh, the researcher David Wilcock, who has stated that he has insider information that the secret Mars colony 
uh, now includes 550,000 Americans. Factor in the carrying capacity of Mars, a planet with very, uh, very low oxygen levels that just about allow you to breathe, very little water, very little vegetation, scarce food supplies besides some of the carnivorous predators on the surface. And I think that we have is an American colony on Mars that must number at least several hundred thousand people. I would think that the 550,000 number that David has provided is probably pretty close to the truth because they would have been able to assemble a colony relatively rapidly as, all, as long as they could supply the life support for the, for the settlers. Uh, when we were there stumbling around the surface in the early 80s, there were some settlers who were doing things like building rudimentary stone houses for themselves, but there were no U.S. bases there. The only U.S. defense bases on Mars during those years were the jump room facilities themselves, and we're not even sure that those were built by human beings from Earth. They may have been provided by the Martian humanoid civilization or by extraterrestrials. I mean, we don't have the provenance of the jump rooms. We don't even understand how the technology works, but we know it was being used to send us uh, to a place that was described to us as Mars. And if it wasn't Mars, it was terra firma somewhere in the universe and not Earth. Um, so um, I believe that if we're to assume that theory A is valid, that it was the actual terrestrial Mars of our real-time environment right now, as we understand it, you know, the, the planet that every two years comes closest to Earth, that there has to be a U.S. colony there that at least numbers se several hundred thousand, I would think, they would probably cap it at about 500,000 because of the carrying capacity issue. And that would suggest that the, the photograph that the ufologist Bob Dean disclosed at the European Exopolitical Summit in Barcelona, Spain in 2009 probably gives us a pretty clear view as to what these bases look like. They're basically huge buildings that would be like trying to house several thousand people in a small city in something that would look like a very large, like university, you know, modern university library or dorm. Basically, a very large utilitarian building with people staying there 24 hours a day because you wouldn't want to lose personnel unnecessarily to predators on the surface. Because that was a big issue when we were going up there in the early 80s, was staying alive. <coughs> so, um, I don't have direct proof of that because I left the Mars program in 1983. But when you factor in Laura's account that we're going to be hearing tonight, I don't think that we can discount the fact that it's not just about an issue of sending people there now. It's about the fact that we're colonizing Mars. I love this. I absolutely love it. Andy, will you stay with us for the rest of the the broadcast? I want to bring Brett on uh, now, but I, I, want, I want you to stay with us. Is that fine? That's great, Dr. Dean. Dr. Dream. I'd really love to do that. Okay. Perfect. Let's... Um, Let's see here. Let's get uh, let's get Brett on. This is uh, William Brett Stillings. Brett, are you with us? Doctor Dream. <laughs> Welcome to Dream Reality New Earth Radio. Um, you you've been listening to the to the broadcast and um, give us a little bit um, about yourself, Brett, and and then you know lead into um, to or I I can ask further questions, but leading into more information that that, you know, gives us a, a more full picture um, of what, what Andy's been talking about. All right. Um, well, I was born in um, Portsmouth, Virginia, Navy Hospital. I grew up to about age eight in uh, Bowie, Maryland. I was, my father was um, a naval officer, a lieutenant junior grade, um, was on the USS Forrestal when it blew up in 68. We, uh, Moved out to from there to California in, in '75. Um, I then did a growing up in um, in La Cunada, uh California, which is just a little north of Glendale. Um, uh, one of the things about that is uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, lived in La Cunada, Actually, lived up Gould uh, just a little bit after Angel's Crest Highway, uh, right near the. Um, the car dealership, the VW car dealership that was there at the time. Um, the uh, around 1978-79, 79, 79 uh, till recently, or recently, it was um, affirmed that uh, 79 was my first teleportation uh, experience, where uh, 
we um, were went down to L.A. or someplace in L.A. We I believe it was Silmar. Um, a, a lot was surrounding Silmar at the time, and I think this was a predecessor to Palmdale, where Lockheed Skunk Works had eventually moved to. Um, but we went we went out to Silmar, and I was very specifically, and I have uh, such. Uh, total recall of the day was we were on the second floor in a building and it, it was I just a, a couple months prior was when I was actively being trained to um, you know I didn't know for what and you know and it was kind of it was really a frustrating guessing game you know that it that it was just I just had to kept getting coaxed have to go along with it have to go along with it you're being shown something and you know what didn't really get to ask too many questions and we in uh we went to uh Selmar we're in, in the second floor of a building and i was um my father was talking with a a, a gentleman there and we kind of stepped off into this uh sort of small room wasn't too small and um my dad uh, was talking and he said uh, all right uh, so show me show me what you've been doing in the garage and I, I was kind of a little stumped on that and he, he showed me with his arms and I put my arms in front of me and I, I um, ran forward and my dad was was very um, there was a little bit of discussion my dad uh, looked at me and said you, you know in a kind of a firm voice you keep your your hands in front of you under no circumstance put them at your side or anything. You keep them in front of you. And then there was a little bit more discussion. I, I don't remember really what was said. And um, he says, uh, he says, okay, we're doing this now. And um, he says, uh, keep your head down. He says, don't look up. And th there was a, a little bit of a, a blindfold issue, but it, it eventually worked out to where I didn't work uh, use it, but I kept my eyes shut. And my dad says, I I'm going to run with you just like in the garage but, but just for a couple seconds I'm going to take my hand off you and but you're going to run with that and I saw in front there there was a structure but but there was no effect yet I could hear some things after I closed my eyes and at that point we, we ran forward and I kept my my hands in front of me I definitely exceeded the distance and kind of felt that little bit of panic and we exceeded that distance of where that wall was in front clearly by running and uh, I felt my father's hand leave my shoulder and um, and I started to feel something and, and I was kind of starting to think about what I was feeling and then all of a sudden I heard you can you can open your eyes now and we were clearly outside we were outside of a building we were clearly outside it, it was more or less the the desert and um that really was my first teleportating experience um and th this is very ironically and this is the truth of the whole thing was it was very vainly to pick up the family car <laughs> <laughs> it's no yeah i know it's, it's, it's sadly it's no joke i mean it, it's uh, i don't know what it was doing out there or why but i i know for a fact and i remember this specifically it was an eight to nine hour drive back and i didn't get in until about two in the morning which i remember very specifically as i had to go back i had to go to school the next day and um that was uh you know that was 1979 and uh well so let let's move ahead just a little bit. Um, now, you didn't you had not met Andy until the campground um, at the lake near Mount Shasta. Is that right? Right. That was in 1980. Uh, it wasn't too long after my first jump. And what what did you know about Andy prior to meeting him? I didn't hear anything. I heard a little bit of something a week prior, but the day that we left. For, for Shasta in 1980 was uh, was my dad was was telling me that 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 you're going to meet somebody that's done quite a bit more than what that that you've done so far but hopefully you'll get to do and uh, he, he's 
done time travel, in fact, from what I hear. And, uh, but, you know, I'm still, I'm still kind of looking into that. And, uh, the, uh, so we, we pull, basically pulled out of the driveway and we proceeded up to, uh, Mount Shasta, near Mount Shasta. And right before we got there, about, uh, about 45, uh, 45 minutes or so, we pulled off to a, um, to a, uh, Basically, it looked like a gas station without the pumps. But you got you got to remember back then, back then in, in Sha- near the Shasta area, it really wasn't that developed, and things were spread out a little bit more. It's a little bit more enclosed now. Has a lot more businesses and, and buildings and whatnot around it. And uh, very specifically, when when we yeah, you know, very much like Andrew's experience is, I remember in the camper, my dad plugged in a a, a um, an electric shaver. It was that brown one. In fact, I, I still have that thing. He he uh, he ingrained his name on it on the chrome at the at the base of it. Tom Stillings, and that was that was his shaver, and uh, that was what he used. Um, he uh, I I don't know what was going on with that or or what was happening, but they were. My dad was obviously doing something, interacting with something, or trying to validate something but very much he, he I was I was sitting in that car for a while and uh, he eventually came out and and he was clearly not clean shaven and he was clearly a little bit weighed a little bit more he just he, he seemed there was just a, a thing where he, he seemed heavier and and I was I was coaxed right I guess he, I had some look on my face or something but but he looked looked at me and said don't look up just don't don't notice, and I, I just went back to to my book that I had. I think the history book or something. I had something open. I believe it's a history book. And we got in the car and and we drove off. That was um, that was we identified on a, on a trip to uh, um, uh, kind of a validation trip. That uh, that was McLeod Market, and um, it, it looks a little bit different, but but you can see where. Where it looked very much the same, the parking lot looks a little smaller, <laughs> but uh, you you just you knew it was more or less you knew it was the same place. So, Brett, I gotta ask, you know, these experiences um, bizarre to say the least. I mean, how did you process that? Like, what what goes? How old were you at this time? I was about thir- I was thirteen and a half, and I believe nineteen uh, eighty. So how does a how does a thirteen year old process the sort of bizarre outrageous stuff? Dad goes into McLeod Market, comes you know clean shaven, comes out you know as though days had passed and stuff. I mean this is it's for me to process it as a forty seven year old hearing it. What's a thirteen year old experience with this? The beautiful, most easily exp- explainable or explanation I could possibly give is that. He doesn't. <laughs> you uh-huh. don't, and that's what every controller counts on. <laughs> right. That they're just. I mean, you basically you get tormented and kind of torn apart later later in age. Honestly, I mean, going through this whole life progression is is not anything I expected, and and there's been a lot of. Uh, I'm sure you can attest to. Uh, um, you know. With other people, uh, two o'clock in the morning, panicky phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, you get you get people that that's very akin to a therapy session. <laughs> so, so let's let's jump into this. I want to hear from you about Barry or Barack Obama. You know, tell us what your experience was with him, and 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 you know how all that came about for you. Well, not. Not too short. Not not too uh, long after that, I was um, up up in the shaft area. We we'd gone back after meeting Andrew up on um, near Lake Siskiyou, and showed showed him the boundary layer material. And the uh, till about six months ago, we were both just remembering word for word almost everything that had been said, and. Uh, 
it led to revelations that, in in my thinking, that the boundary layer material uh, worked in, in the fashion where it it does its effect when it's in the presence of a gravity generator, which explained my remembering that my dad went back into the camper and went under the seat that I was not allowed to look in. One of the very few times that you're not allowed to see, you know, look looking at dad's work so don't don't open you know where the gun was kept <laughs> and um so i believe my you know my father had a gravity generator with him because i remember the boundary layer material wasn't about an inch or two above the ground and when my father was you know stooping to the ground and andrew's father just started to my father moved it closer to the camper and it picked up in height and then I just kind of trailed off and, and just kind of went over by, you know, the, my dad was doing the company stuff, and, and I just kind of trailed off and and looked looked up per- periodically at Andrew and and uh, Raymond Bashago having a discussion with my dad. And uh, but right after that, um, went back a few times and then drove back up to Shasta. And I believe it was about two to three weeks later. It kind of felt longer, but. Right around that area, we were. I was um, at college at the Siskiyous, and um, one one of the incidents that I remember is when I got out of the car. Me and my dad walked to the wrong building, and somebody came out to, uh, just over to the left of the next building over and said, "It's over here." And my dad smiled, and they started talking. And there's uh, somebody in, in the uh, parking lot who I believe was Andy. Um, there's a name that I heard when I, when I was being introducing myself in the classroom and being introduced to people was in, in the parking lot. There was a, a very, very um, clear word that I did hear was Satoro right before about 10 feet to the door walking in. About uh, two or hours later, um, there was a, or about an hour later, it was actually, it took a while, but uh, about an hour later, I was uh, I walked in the room, and there was already people sitting down. And my father was having a discussion with somebody outside. We walked in, and I sat down. I sat down, uh, started to sit down towards the middle of the classroom, and and that was where Andrew was, was right about in the general vicinity. And uh, my father asked me on to go sit up front, and I sat um, the second chair uh, just over to the left of somebody who was later introduced uh, introduced himself and specifically as himself as Barry and Barry what Barry Satoro uh, how do you how do you spell that and it it was it was spelled I, I don't remember how he spelled it but I remember it very specifically Satoro it was s you know as s o e blah 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 but um that was later as Barry Satoro who I very specifically recall seeing on uh, Mars and uh we get to that later. <laughs> but um, there was uh, quite a few other people, uh, Regina Dugan and uh, Ed Dames, who, who was Ed Dames and was in that class. You know, whether he was going back and forth from Germany or whatnot, you know, teleporting, I'm sure, he was uh, nonetheless, um, as I'm fairly confident uh, can be shown, that, that he was clearly... Uh, in California near the Shasta area in 1980 with uh, standing in front of a camper with a history, ninth grade history book in the window and a license plate. <laughs> but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Dr. Dream, if I, might, if I might jump in here. Please. You know, I really have to thank Brett not only for coming forward. I mean, he's one of our, you know, ch- ch- champions of the truth by contacting me and and, and enabling me to, to, to share these memories with him and bring them forward. But... But Brett and I, think, I mean, think of the, the juridical significance of this in a trial in a court of law. We agree on the identity of five of the ten students who three of their parents were, namely my father, Raymond, his father, Thomas Stillings, and Barry Satoro slash Barack Obama's mother, Stanley Ann Dunham. We agree that the instructor was Major Ed Dames, and we've recovered what we think was the name of his then-girlfriend, which was either Joanne or Joni. So, you know, Brett and I have established here about 10 or 11 people that were there. And I think that would be fairly persuasive in a court of law if you had two or three people saying, well, I was at this location and here's who was there. 
but, but, but Brett's come up with some really remarkable feats of memory. Like he remembered, and, and I can verify that during the discussion of predators, Ed Dame said that of the 97,000 people that we have thus far sent to Mars, only 7,000 have survived after five years. I mean, that's a direct quote that Brett provided to me at age 44 from experiences that he had when he was 13 years old. Uh, you know, so we're, we were dealing with a group of young people who were very bright and in some cases had special abilities. I think Brett's probably, among others, was his mechanical prowess. I mean, one thing Brett didn't describe when he introduced himself tonight is that he was repairing television sets at age four. Um, so this was a, an unusual group of teenagers, and I think if you look at our outcomes in life and the special skills that we had, it makes sense that it was this particular group of young people that they were, they were training to go to another planet. Wow. Now, uh, Andy, uh, now that you're uh, here with us, I'd like to ask you real quick about Barry Satoro and um, if, um, if he was identified as a future U.S. president uh, back during your training. Yes. There were several instances when that matter was discussed. The first time it was discussed, I was sitting in front of my father in the, in the seats there, in, you know, in Ed Dame's class. Um, Brett was to my right. His father, Tom, was sitting behind Brett to my father's right. And I think we all kind of were standing up to kind of shake a leg, you know, during a break from our seats. Barry Satora walked forward in the classroom to talk to Ed Dames, and Brett's father stated something like to, to Brett, something like, Brett, how do you feel or what is it like being in a Mars training class like this with a future American president? And he kind of nodded to, to Barry Satora as he, as he was walking up to the front of the classroom. And before, uh, before Brett could answer, my father thrust two fingers into the aisle between all of us and said, two future presidents, and looked over at me. So we're, we've been trying to interpret what my father meant. Was he actually identifying me also as a future president who had been identified by the CIA's quantum access capability? Was he just speaking up for me as my dad or trying to buck me up to, to pursue... Um, you know, bold ideals and outcomes in my life? Uh, was, he, was he just affirming his belief that I could be president? We don't know. But Brett seems to have concluded, and I have kind of guardedly concluded, that it was also something that was known to the CIA. So I'm kind of living in a situation where I'd like to serve my country as president. I think I could do a good job at it. I think I'm up to the task but I don't have an organization in place, and my life hasn't currently evolved as if I'm destined to become president. Um, in fact, I've never held elective office, but there seems to have been an insider understanding that was revealed in that discussion that the CIA people auditing the class, namely my father, Tom Stillings, and Stanley Ann Dunham, were aware that several of us were destined to serve as president of the United States. Now, if we assume arguendo that that's what my father meant by making that statement, that begs the question of what were they doing throwing several pre future presidents together in a Mars training class? What about the risk of losing them on the surface of Mars to predation? Um, I saw two of our colleagues devoured by predators on the surface. So why would they have sent two future presidents? Were they trying to test our mettle so that we could later withstand the ordinary stresses of, of the presidency? <laughs> as distinguished from, let's say, the, the stress of being chased by a predator on the Martian surface? Um, was it some attempt to bring us into the intelligence community on that basis? I mean, because the strange thing about Barry Satoro slash Barack Obama after that is he embraced his African uh, identity as the son or putative son of Barack Obama Sr. and was really on the kind of black nationalist left for several years uh, as a political activist, an anti-apartheid activist, He's quoted from 1982 saying, there's a revolution coming. We better prepare for it so we can lead it. So there's somewhat of a fair measure of cognitive dissonance here or a little bit of a clash of interpretations of the background of Barack Obama when you, when you factor into the fact that our account is that he was being trained by the CIA to be one of the young people who was being sent up to Mars while on campus and in political circles. Um, positioning himself as a sort of a, a black separatist or black nationalist opposition leader or activist socialist vis-a-vis -vis the American power structure. 
So we're really talking about two Barack Obamas here, and they're not, they're not accounts that can very easily be um, accommodated to the other. He, he's, either, um, he's either somebody who was so disaffected by serving in this program that be, he became a leftist activist, uh, or he was some kind of CIA operative when he began to be profiled on the, the black nationalist left in the, in the uh, early and mid-'80s. Certainly into his 30s, Barack Obama was espousing socialism and was a Socialist Party candidate for the state Senate in Illinois when he first entered politics in 1996 at age 35. Um, so we have an insight into Barack Obama's background that either indicates that he was disaffected by serving on a CIA program and became a leftist activist, or when he did begin to position himself as a left, le leftist activist, he was in all likelihood serving as a surveillance and an informant of legitimate black activists on behalf of, for example, the CIA. I got it. Now, we're getting some questions from the uh, the chat room, and, and it's uh, one of them I'm going to ask now because it's a question um, that, that, that I'm curious about. Um, you two aren't holding back anything. I mean, the details are extraordinary. The information, you're, you're putting it out there um, with no hesitation and no fear at all. Are, are is there any fear behind the scenes of reprisals against you? I mean, um, you know, of of us finding you know your body one day with a bullet in the back of your head, and and the government saying, well, it was a suicide or something like that. I mean, it, talk to me a little bit about. I mean, is there any fear here? You're you're talking about the president of our country being in this Mars program, this huge cover up, all this stuff. You've got Major Ed Dames. You've got DARPA, you you know, all of this going on. I mean, is there any fear that um, that that something could happen to you, gentlemen? Andy, you go first. Okay, well, basically my faith is an almighty God, as I can't even articulate it. Okay, so I believe in a personal God. And I have just I just decided at midlife not to live with fear. Because what fear does is it diminishes your expression of life. If if you're worried about dying which is a ludicrous position to take. It's a, ludic right. it's a ludicrous state of mind because right. while we're not immortal, we're physically mortal, we possess an eternal spirit or soul. And so it's self-limiting and, and even absurd to not implement your destiny or not live the broadest expression of your life simply because you're afraid of losing your life. If that was the case, many of the great feats of human history never would have been attempted. I mean, George Washington had four musket ball holes placed in his cloak and four horses shot out from beneath him. President Madison was wounded in the shoulder by a, a British musket ball at the Battle of Trenton. You know, when my uncle saw General Patton roll by during the invasion of Europe that Laura's great-grandfather led, he was standing with, in the back of a jeep with his hands on his hip, exhorting the soldiers to move forward in, into, into Germany and, you know, into enemy lines in, in, in France. So, I mean, when you think about the fact that our very liberty has been, has been safeguarded or, or has been guaranteed, as it were, by over a million Americans who have sacrificed their lives in the wars that we've made, waged, most of which have been moral, some of which have been immoral acts of aggressive war, particularly recently. But the great number of American wars have been just wars because we were formally operating under a Judeo-Christian doctrine of just war. Um, but when you realize everything that we enjoy as a result of the courageous people who lived before us, who also believed in a personal God and in the eternity of their soul, at a certain point in my life, I just decided to live without fear and say, well, I may lose my life doing this, but at least I've spent my life pursuing a noble ideal. And I think that Brett would probably say something similar. Uh, great answer, Andy. I just, um, you know, respected you tremendously before that answer, and it just skyrocketed. Brett, chime in on this a little bit. Yeah. Um, very, very much what Andrew said is very much how I feel. <clears throat> in fact, I was very much the good little boy, and never spoke of anything, you know, outside of my father or, or the other, some of the other people that were, that, that were 
pointed out to as 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 you know, you know company, good company. And um, but I have incurred, and, and a lot of the reason why I am coming forward is I have incurred a lot of retro uh, punishment, and I mean a lot of it, uh, to the effect of getting that mystery uh, phone call from somebody who was identified as working with the United States government as to why I should not be employed, Those, you know, to, to points where all of a sudden, you know, having almost a flawless record at, at you know, never mind Fortune 500 companies, you know, fortune, these were Fortune 50 companies uh, like Baxter Bioscience and Quest Diagnostics and quite, quite a few others, to where I would just mysteriously be walked out. And, uh, you know, well, somebody called. Uh, who called? No answer. Um, you know, it's, you know, why coming forward is because the punishment will stop. It, it will stop. You know, you cannot give in to these, these type of people. I mean, there, there's just no living any kind of life whatsoever with, with those people behaving the way they do. And, you know, one... one really good way is putting out what they fear I love it I, I just so much respect uh, for you two and for our next guest the, the, the truth movement would not be what it is if, if you know people didn't step out of fear and, and just put all that behind them and, and the three of you um, you know really embody that and so let's bring on um can I add a little something? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, just just to put it out there, just just because I don't feel I've been loud enough. There's actually an underground transport system that I actually rode on. Um, it didn't get up above 50 miles an hour, and it looked like a kind of a slightly more improved San Francisco trolley. It actually <laughs> looked like the back end of a 1984 RTD bus with, with, without the front, just a little bit larger windows, a little bit thinner shelled. And that actually goes from Catalina Island straight through the under the building of the CIA El Segundo office, the main headquarters, goes right through Baxter Bioscience in Glendale, uh, borderline L.A., goes right just a mile to the east of Bram Library, and goes straight on up to Edwards Air Force Base, all in a straight line. And, uh, you know, you, you can maybe think about that when... I worked at Baxter in 2000 that they had a little bit of problems with the FDA before the FDA got completely bought out and, and instructed to by the government to allow Baxter to do what they were doing, was that when they temporarily had to do some uh, shipments of some equipment and some other things, they actually used that underground transport system, as in, you know, from, from Deerfield, Illinois, how do you get, uh, and from uh, Baxter at Thousand Oaks, how do you get a uh, swine flu from a class three environment without shipping labels to the Ukraine? You know, the only thing they couldn't produce was shipping labels. <laughs> and nobody thought about it. I'm telling you, all this all this information and, and what you've just brought up is almost like just another tangent, or, you know, for like another show. I appreciate it. But let's... um. Let's let's bring uh, Laura Eisenhower on. Laura is a, a cosmic pathologist, a global alchemist. She's also the great granddaughter of President Eisenhower, and her experience um, really gives us um, some more to go on with all this. Laura, are you on with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you absolutely. Welcome to the show this evening. Um, just with time and everything being what it is, I want you to kind of dive right in and tell us um, what happened in 2006, 2007 that relates to the Mars cover-up. Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'm the later sort of uh, um, story in the sense that there is a colony there and I was recruited to go, whereas Brett and Andy were very much, you know, building blocks to um, the implementation of it as far as, you know, how people were experiencing it and, and what they needed to, you know, go through to determine, you know, how they would be able to handle it, you know, being on the surface. And in 2006, I was recruited to be a permanent colonist. And so we discovered that our stories really do line up. Um, there's a lot of similarities as far as the names and the people 
and their associations. And um, I was recruited in a pretty manipulative way. Um, the person that recruited me posed as, you know, somebody that, um, you know, didn't reveal for nine months into the relationship that he was actually sent to uh, recruit me specifically. Um, previously, I had thought that we had just met, and I ended up, you know, I just thought that I had met somebody that was going and had invited me along. Um, I didn't realize how sophisticated it was, and this is where we get into the quantum access technologies and, um, you know, some of the technologies that uh, Andrew speaks about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's really what happened, and I just spent that time, you know, breaking free of it, knowing that that wasn't my path, and really delving into way more than, um, than I can even put into words uh, that, that connect to all of this on, on multidimensional levels. And so that's really where it began for me, and it really just validates the fact that what they were experiencing um, uh, visiting Mars, um, you know, there is something there, and uh, they, wa they want to bring, you know, a lot of people up there, and that's probably why Obama was up there. Um, as president, he would need to experience that if that's where, you know, a portion of humanity was going to end up as far as this agenda is concerned. Well, let's talk specifically a little bit, Laura. What were some of the events that led up to your recruitment? I mean, the, um, I've heard the story. It's absolutely fascinating. We don't have, you know, the hour, couple of hours that, that your story deserves tonight. But, but give us a little bit of an idea of, you know, how this kind of came about naturally and then, you know, what the red flags were and when you realized, like, whoa, something's a little more bizarre or strange about all of this than you had originally thought. So I uh, went to a festival and I met somebody and we started seeing each other because we had, you know, a lot of compatibility and it just seemed to be working. And... Um, he uh, visited me in Washington, D.C. and went to secret meetings. And as I was, you know, in a relationship, I found out more and more about these people are curious. And uh, he had had deer mutilation experiences, abduction experiences, and he was receiving, um, you know, telepathy from what he called the patrons. Um, and uh, the group that he was with, I was very curious about because they were studying and researching things connected to UFOs, and they were known to be remote viewers. Um, but as I was, you know, trying to understand all of this, you know, trying to just be in a relationship and really, really focus on my mission on Earth. And, you know, I happened since I was a child. I found it very odd that, you know, that this concept is coming up. But like I said in the beginning, I thought I was just being invited or this was just presented to me. And I discovered that he had been sent to find me. Um, this was after I was already suspicious because of red flags. I had had a strange dream. I started to notice his behavior was off. Um, what seemed to be he was under some level of control. He would do missions and and disappear for days and not know what happened or, or he did not want to tell me. And then, you know, just something was telling me this is, there's something going on here. And I started to research the names that I was hearing about, you know, that he was associated with. And I heard terms like handler, um, you know, somebody specific was his handler and that I could get a handler and that, you know, you know, he was all just getting very strange. And so I broke away from the relationship as much as possible. Um, and I discovered that the names he was talking about were connected to things like, you know, the grays and military abductions and mass manipulation, artificial telepathy even. And, um, you know, and then when I found out that he was sent to find me, once I had pretty much broken free and he was really leaking all sorts of information to me, it all started to make sense. And then, you know, why I was recruited started to come up, started to come up, and um, I started to put a lot of pieces together. But before I knew that he was specifically sent to find me, I was already, um, I had already delved into you know, what they didn't want me to know, because I was only dealing with him. They were never having me meet up with this group. It wasn't like, you know, we were all joining in council together. They were working through him, and it was like a trap. It was, you know, to manipulate me through my heart. They validated that I couldn't be controlled through my mind. I hadn't been in any projects as a child. Um, I do believe I was targeted as a child, though, because I noticed something very odd very early on. Um, but, uh, you know, they were just trying to manipulate me through, through my heart um, and, and the relationship. And um, so, yeah, when I really discovered that some of these names were associated with things like heart technology, um, you know, I really, you know, got into my philosophy about why I think this is all happening and where it originated and, and what it really means for us. And, and so it was helpful for me because when I really backed out and I realized that I had broken free, it really launched me even more profoundly on what I came here to do. Um, and it launched, you know, a strong catalyst and the backdrop of what this timeline represents compared to what I really represent and what I'm here to do on Earth.
Wow. Um, uh, I believe Dr. Dream. Uh, are you still with us? Yep. No, I'm right here. So, <laughs> sorry, I was I was muted and asking an entire question. Um, so, Lori, the the plan was for you to um, be recruited to to go to the Mars colony, and everything was all in place. Well, why didn't you go? Well, I mean, I you know ever since I was you know really young, you know, I, I had just a really strong calling. Um, the presence of my great grandfather has always been with me, and I just have always known what I'm here to do. It connects with, you know, our multidimensional awareness. It connects, uh, excuse me, it connects with um, just the, the tests and tribulations that we're up against in order to wake up and really, you know, be aware of what our abilities are and, and aware of how much this world is an illusion and that, you know, being in this game, you know, produces, you know, a lot of pain and suffering, but at the same time, in the bigger picture, this experience is really to wake us up and to awaken our abilities and, and our creative freedom and, to really take the reins and say, hey, I want to be in charge of my future, and the best gift that I can give this world is to assist them in waking up to what their truth is, so that, you know, we're not being led astray by fear or different agendas or leaders that, you know, say that we need to do this or need to do that based on some future projection. And um, so, of course, you know, my thing was I'm not going to go because this is not my picture. This is not what I want, and I'm not afraid of death. So, you know, whatever destiny you know, that befalls me here on Earth, you know, based on this decision, if it does lead to death, so be it, because I'm here to not be a controlled being and to have my freedom. And in life and death, that's going to carry over. Um, and these, you know, decisions are, are, are long-standing, whereas giving your power to something else and being controlled, you know, gets you into a web and an entanglement that I do not want to be a part of. I'm all about traveling through space. I've been astral traveling, as, you know, going into the ether since I was a kid. And, you know, I see us, you know, connecting with our universal family and, and traveling the cosmos, but not under these circumstances that I want to do it. I'm not in the fear pictures of cataclysms and all this. Even if, you know, the Earth changes, we have to recognize that, you know, the planetary body is going to go through its process of regeneration, restoration, and, um, you know, really shaking off a lot of these, these powers and technologies and, and false um, agendas and, 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 and things that it's been carrying for a long time. While, you know, the fear of, you know, all these catastrophes in, in the end times is hitting us and we're being dragged into the New World Order agenda, as long as we stay true to who we are, we transcend that agenda and we are on a whole other timeline and it's based on the power of our intent and our beliefs and, and you know, what, what, what we stand for. Um, so there's really nothing that we're up against except for, you know, that big test, you know, who are you and what... What do you want to create? It doesn't matter what they're throwing at us. It's not a linear time, concrete, reality type thing. It's, it's really here to serve a purpose. And as much as we consider there being a, a lot of dark individuals out there, we'd be surprised to know that um, we can see them as assisting us um, in, in reclaiming all that we are. Um, we also have to understand that, you know, our physical body is made up of, um, you know, atomic and subatomic particles of light um, within molecules and compounds. And so even the physical body is not as, as solid as we think. And, um, you know, and that's probably why some of these experiences and, and seeing our world as somewhat of a virtual reality is, is legitimate. Um, and, uh, you know, it's our beliefs, it's our frequency, it's our energies, and, and the truth and in, 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 in what we stand for is, is what directs our future. And so I stand for that, and I'm here to assist others in being empowered in that. And uh, we're, we're moving into a higher density. And those who choose not to go will go through another round um, until they do wake up. And the fear thing is, is really a choice. You know, are you going to wake up and, 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 and recognize that, you know, you're way beyond all this, or are you going to buy into it? And as long as we buy into it, we're, we're caught in this cycle. Well, we come here to assist. And I came here to assist, and I've known it, you know, since I was young, and I'm also here to learn and grow because no matter what you master in the past, we're always, you know, given new challenges to, to step up to. And, and this was a challenge for me, and, you know, I, I, I respect it and I honor it in my life. And, uh, and where I am today, you know, with these other whistleblowers with their incredible stories who have, you know, really done what I've done in a, in a lot of ways, and, and you and others. We're, we're, you know, here to be who we are, and nothing is going to get in the way of what that is going to manifest if, if we keep a boundary and stay true to it and stay devoted. Um, and that's why I didn't go, because everything in my being was saying no. And, and, I, and, I, mm. and I stay true to that. Even though they said this will protect you and you're going to have this incredible position and your boys, you know, it was very much, you know, there was no torture, there was no abuse. Um, it sounded, you know, like 
wow, this is a great opportunity to escape all the, the doom scenarios that are being presented to people. But to me, it had a ring of hierarchy or, or we're chosen, but what about the rest of the human race? I'm not here to run off and neglect you know, something that I find to be the most important thing ever, which is to empower the unified field and that we all are one. And there's no greater or lesser. There's just some who are more awake than others. And it, it's time to gather the forces and, and get out of this duality and, uh, and really be on the true adventure. And those tests and trials that they put us through, you know, aren't meant to take us down. They're really meant to wake us up, even if those that are behind them could care less. <laughs> and they're just, you know, doing their part. They're playing their part in the game. Um, and they only need to know based on a need to know basis. But, um, you know, we're, we're really gathering together. And uh, I, I feel nothing but positive energy about where we're headed. Back then, I knew that I was digging out of, you know, this matrix of control and manipulation. And um, I feel free. And no headline or news is going to take that away from me. And, um, you know, we, we are, you know, getting a lot of weird information now. And this is the time to really come together even more and expose these truths. Um, we deserve to know what's going on. and. Um, I'm grateful to be one of the beings that is uh, here to, to share it and, uh, and to enjoy other people's truths as they awaken to who they are. So really quite an incredible experience, I must say. I love all of this, Laura. Now, I, I, I just want to ask you, I want to ask you about um, the, the Eisenhower legacy, you being part of this family, um, your mission here as, you know, the embodiment that you are. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm very devoted to, you know, the divine feminine energy. You know, all the different aspects of ourselves have been exiled. You know, how history has been rewritten and how, you know, we've really been dumbed down and, and put into a place of feeling separate from things like God or um, our leaders and sort of just us and them and kind of, you know, this powerlessness. And so I've really been devoted to the forces that if we awaken, we can gain our sovereignty back and, and reclaim our power. And so, uh, you know, in my city, you see it and energy type of unit. And you can also and how you feel it just needs attention. It needs to be recovered. It needs to be resurrected out of, you know, the depths and, and um, you know, needs to be remembered, you know, in, in the human consciousness. And, uh, you know, Eisenhower, you know, really stood for, you know, exposing the military industrial complex. You know, he fought in the Second World War. He wanted to take down the Nazis, and all of a sudden, here he is as president. And you know, the Nazi energy is moving into the American government through you know Project Paperclip and and all the different experiments that were going on. You know, manifested even more mind control projects, MK Ultra type projects. And um, just to see you know the struggle that he went through to not really be able to tell us the truth or really do what his heart and soul and spirit really wanted to do. Um, I, I just had this incredible affinity within my whole life, just knowing that, you know, that somehow I could pick up where he left off. Not take over his role, but, you know, that I was doing something similar, you know, in my own soul journey. You know, in so many lifetimes, not able to complete the mission or not able to express my truth. And a lot of us, you know, we keep coming back because we know that this is an alchemical evolution that we're in and it's leading to this incredible transformation. And this is the lifetime that we're all shining. We're all just stepping into it, and, you know, I, I feel the transparency and the lack of identity. I, I just in service to Gaia, and to me, you know, that's where I find the divine feminine energies in a cosmic and earthly level, um, and I'm just kind of here to remind us all of that, um, as many, you know, are already remembering, and, uh, yeah, so my relationship with my great-grandfather and just, you know, the sensitivity I felt and just the love that I felt and knowing that he connected with the Venetians in the 1960s and, um, you know, all of his other encounters and just really connecting to the struggle that he was in. I just really have found that side by side we're, you know, we're kind of doing this together, you know, in our own way, and it's great we're both Libras, and, you know, I look at a picture of him, and I just, it's like my heart just opens, and it's just like, I mean, the love is just so incredible, and my grandfather's still alive, and I get to see him, and he really connects with me, and he knows, you know, he really understands my path more than anybody else in my family, and, um, you know, and there's a lot of negative projections, there's a lot of misunderstandings, I'm sure a lot of people are very confused about this family line, um, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, shown me a lot. Um, shown me a lot about what, what needs to end, what needs to be awakened um, in the political sphere. And uh, it opened up, you know, well, before that, what was opened up to me was what, what the necessities on the spiritual. And uh, we, we need to understand that all of this is connected. There's, everything is connected. The story of the divine feminine, the military-industrial complex, the Mars agenda, our ancient history, the Anunnaki, all these different races and beings. I mean, we're, you know... 
it's, 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 it's his mandala. I mean, everything's connected, including us. And uh, so I just, you know, really connected to this very young and wrote a book about it called The Grail of Venus. And um, really about, you know, how we personify the Venus transits in our heart space. And the Venus transits, as the mind calendar understood, is leading to this incredible shift time where we're moving into, you know, the, what's more available to us and what's awakening within us is launching us into something truly profound. And of course, they're competing to throw us off center, but I can just, you know, guarantee that the cosmos is on our side. Everything, you know, planetarily, you know, based on alignments and just, you know, what has been happening on a cosmic level, because the cosmos is intelligence. You know, these planetary bodies aren't just floating balls. And how they affect all of us, um, we're being led into something that is so incredibly profound. And, um, you know, yeah, things are going to try and throw us off, but if you see that it serves us to be tested, to be thrown down so that we can get back up in our own way, in our own truth, um, you know, we, we don't have to be victims. We don't have to uh, have any fear. And, um, you know, yeah, he's just an amazing man, and that's all I can say. And, you know, on a universal level, we're all family, and I just know he loves the world, humanity, and I do too. And um, it's, it's just my passion to be of service and to, you know, walk my truth. Now, Laura, inside um, the family, the Eisenhower family, um, is, was there any awareness of Ike's meeting with um, any extraterrestrials or, or any of the, the things that are c coming to light now? I mean, you know, you're aware of that. Um, we've, we've heard you on different shows and at conferences speak of it. But anyone else in your family aware of this or, or are they kind of chosen to stay in the dark about it? It's unbelievable. I mean, with all the cousins and, you know, sisters and family members that I have that are in my age group, I'm the only one that talks about it, that acknowledges it. Um, and I'm not saying anybody's hiding anything because we're a very open, we're a close family, we're a very normal family, you know, out playing wiffle ball, Thanksgiving, you know, just family reunions and it's all just, you know, I mean, we have bizarre discussions, but they never go into this. Every time I bring it up, and I, and I have brought it up numerous times, everybody's convinced you went to a dentist appointment. And... You know, I'm not one to believe anything that I hear. I go straight to my gut, my intuition, and the research that I've done, and it's just like, I'm sorry, I'm being shown a completely different picture. Will I ever get the chance to really sit down with everybody and tell them all that I've discovered? I don't know, but I'm certainly looking forward to the day. I think they might be open to it as well. Um, and I think anybody that does know and is keeping it secret might, you know, be doing it out of fear because God knows what, um, you know, they deal with. Um, what Obama, you know, even deals with, even though, you know, I would have taken a bullet to not sign the bill. I mean, I'm the kind of person that I would rather die than sell the human population or, the, or humanity or our country over to dark forces. I, I, I can't, wouldn't be able to live with myself. But you don't know, you know, I don't know what they're dealing with. I mean, if they're being silenced, I, I think that's very odd. I'm not getting that hit that they are, but they're certainly not saying anything. They're not speaking about it. I brought up the Mars thing. And there was a few nods of the head, like, you know, people were interested. But then all of a sudden, you know, the dinner's over and it's time to go home. And, you know, I've tried to follow up with emails. And I still have a lot to do as far as connecting with family on all this type of stuff. But nobody, nobody has talked about any of the stuff I talk about. You know, I mean, we're talking, it's more about the, you know, historians writing about the war, writing about him as a general, writing about some of his experiences as a president. None of this stuff. Um, you know, and I, and I hear about it from other people just, also, uh, there's one book, I can't remember the name, it's about, how, you know, healing Gaia from the trauma of war. You know, he was all involved in that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just surprising none of these things ever came up. So I just sort of took that route and stepped away from, you know, what they were saying, even though I do think that they believe in what they were saying, absolutely. Really, you know, really incredible people, really heart-based, and I, and I really do mean it. Um, I just, you know, just followed my own, my own uh, intuition on it all. Um, and like I said, I just I hope to have more discussions with them because uh, who knows what will be revealed. We just haven't had enough opportunities, I guess. Well, I really um, I really honor you for for walking your authentic path, and um, uh, and it's just no mistake to to have the three of you uh, on tonight's broadcast because this is such important information to get out. And and you know the truth can't be can't be held down and and um, so I applaud each of you for for the role that that you're playing and and standing on such 
a solid foundation within yourselves to be, you know, putting this out there for all of us. And I know that um, I'm not the only one that, that has that appreciation. Now, we're about to the last, uh, we've got about six or seven minutes um, of the broadcast uh, left before uh, before Ilya and I close everything up. Um, Andy and, and Brad and Laura, you're all here. Um, let's Let's start with with Andy, and we'll just go in order and give you an opportunity, uh, you know, a, a couple minutes each, to um, you know add anything you want to add, mention any sites you want to mention, you know, give us any any other information that we de either didn't ask about or didn't you know show up um, in the conversation. So so Andy, go ahead, will you please? Yeah, just to give the broad picture, I, th I think it's safe to say that in the 20th century. Four models of political economy or of government contested for dominance. Two of them were characterized by authoritarian government, government, namely fascism and communism, and two were characterized by classically liberal or non-authoritarian government. And those would be the model of democratic capitalism that the United States used to maintain and, let's say, socialism on the Swedish model. Now, two of those forms of government were... were, were maintained in furtherance of notions of, of private holding of property, namely fascism uh, on the German, you know, Nazi German model and democratic capitalism on the American model. Two were dedicated to public ownership of property, namely communism on the Soviet model and socialism on, on the Swedish model. One of the reasons that the United States fought World Wars I and II was to create a world in which democratic capitalism could thrive. Basically, this, the positive synergy between government by the consent of the governed and an economic system that was not administered by the state, but in which people could attain different outcomes based on their effort, their ingenuity, their industriousness, their uh, prudence, their thrift, etc. I think it's safe to say that the model of private ownership of property prevailed in the United States in the Cold War uh, and, you know, the post-war era. The problem is that in the last 50, 65 years since the end of the war that Laura's illustrious great-grandfather uh, was instrumental in helping us to achieve, there's been a shift in the United States uh, from democratic capitalism to fascism. Now, that's what the National Defense Authorization Act embodies. It's a fascist bill that has given the United States military congressional authority uh, to arbitrarily arrest and detain American citizens indefinitely. And so how do we put what's happening now in context in terms of the truth movement? Well, truth is the necessary solvent of government by secrecy in furtherance of authoritarianism. And so we have to push for truth in government. We have to begin electing American presidents who embody the public call for disclosure, for truth in government. Necessarily, we're going to have to implement some form of truth and reconciliation um, in government in which individuals who have served the executive branch, the military, and the intelligence community can come forward and um, tell the truth about what they know has been done in their names. Um, so. Um, I think that there's, there's really uh, great relevance to the truth movement now that our liberty in itself is in danger. And that's, what, that's why I'm going to continue to push for the truth without fear um, on my part in terms of the authoritarian government we see arising around us. And I'm going to continue to tell what I know and also ask others to come forward and share with the people what they know. Because as long as we keep the truth held in front of us, we're going to be able to, to resist the ultimate tyranny of military dictatorship that we now are confronted by. Thank you, Andy. I, I absolutely appreciate that. Brett, are you with us? Right here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say incredible um, for being on. Thank you. The um, time to come forward is now. There, there's been teleportation long before the family SUV and uh, <laughs> yeah the people that some good people that brought the convenience of SUV 
with all the good intentions, and then there's that evil group that wants to kill you with it. You know, whether uh, keep the prices up for them to gain wealth so they can build more underground bases that get nuked or, or whatnot. I'd like to uh, plug uh, Project Pegasus dot net for uh, and um, Project Mars dot net for uh, the most up to date information, and also Ready for the Shift dot com, uh, which is a really really good site. People really need to go to that. And uh, and thank you so much for having me on the show. I just. Uh, I just w I just wish people could just comprehend or just just know what's been been out there and for how long and haven't been living it. Perfect, Brad. Uh, thank thank you so thank much you. for being with us, Andy. But before we move on to Laura, um, point of contact for you or or anything you want to put out there. Uh, just, uh, I thank Brett for the endorsement of my websites. I, I would just say that to those who are devotees of the websites, I'm going to be updating them with the last two years of information. <laughs> um, I pretty much have been in a whirlwind of activity trying to share the truth that I know about. Um, so those those websites are going to get a major uplift in 2012 uh, with the last two years of TV and radio interviews. Um, and I just think we have to watch this election very closely. Um, I think ultimately we'll see a, th a third party insurgency, sort of, not insurgency, but a third party candidacy by Ron Paul, possibly selecting Jesse Ventura of Minnesota um, as, his, um, as his running mate. And I'm, I'm fairly certain that that's the ticket that I'm going to be publicly calling for um, around Christmas time. I've decided to make an announcement and endorse uh, the presidential campaign of Ron Paul and urge the people uh, to nominate Jesse Ventura, uh, Governor Ventura of Minnesota, former Governor Ventura. Of Minnesota as his running mate, because we're really at one of those critical moments in American history where we need bold, independent constitutionalists to save us really uh, from uh, fascism now that we're really on the precipice of entering into um, a period of, of authoritarianism in our history. It was something that I never thought I would see, but something that I find greatly alarming. And so um, I'm going to be emphasizing that theme in my, my public discussions because. I mean, really, the handwriting of fascism in America is on the wall at this time, and we really need to begin speaking about it and also pressuring our fellow citizens to essentially replace the Congress with Americans who will defend the Bill of Rights and the Constitution in, uh, in general, because this, this bill is essentially, essentially effectively suspends the operation of the Bill of Rights. I mean, if you can be arbitrarily arrested and detained without trial, you no longer have the rights that are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Um, you can't rely on them um, as an indefinite detainee. I don't think that's necessary. I think that's part of the fear and paranoia that is sort of the hangover from the Cold War. I think there's less of a need for authoritarian government in the United States now that we're not confronted um, uh, the way we were by the Cold War. And I think we've allowed the war on terror to create a situation in which the American citizenry itself is going to be um, the net um, victim of that war. And I think that's catastrophic, and I, I would just urge my fellow citizens uh, to, to lobby their elected officials, but also replace them with Americans of sounder judgment who understand that our liberty is going to be defended first by, by retaining our civil rights, not having them denied by an authoritarian government. Thank you for that, uh, Andy, and we look forward to um, all that you'll be um, announcing and bringing out um, in the uh, in 2012. Uh, Laura, a couple of minutes just to um, put anything else out there and tie up any loose ends and uh, give us a point of contact, your website, uh, where people can connect with you. Okay, uh, website cosmicdia2012.com. Facebook's a great place to get in touch with me. I have a few pages. And I just want to say, you know, we all have a role. Um, we can't just sit back and be complacent or wait for a savior or somebody else to do it. Um, you know, if, if you're not actually doing something to support what matters most to you, um, this is a time to not live in separation. Each of us counts. Um, you know, I, I completely endorse Ron Paul, Jesse Ventura, and Andrew Bishago for president in 2016. Absolutely and totally. Um, and, you know, these new laws that have passed um, are asking us to really step up and uh, 
if this isn't waking up even the most complete beings, the fact that they pass something like this when the American citizens do not deserve this whatsoever, I don't know what will. Um, and I guess, you know, really support the new paradigm by embodying it. Embody the values, the visions, and the energies that you want to manifest. Be solution-orientated and watch the external forces for deception. Watch for looking too far outside of yourself for direction and answers, but, you know, locate those that you truly feel good about but just don't give your power away. And, um, you know, these three beings that might be in the political sphere, um, you know, in the future, well, Andrew Bishago, of course, you know, I, I just completely endorse. And I think, you know, Ron Paul and Jesse Ventura are the greatest hope we have right now to turn things around. And uh, I just, you know, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's always, you know, incredible to be on your show and always an honor to be with Andrew and Brett Stillings. And um, I just want to thank you very much. Oh, this has just been great. So, on behalf of Dream Reality New Earth Radio, thank you, Andrew Bashago, thank you, William Brett Stillings, and thank you, Laura Eisenhower. Um, thank you for all that you do, for not backing down, and for just no fear and no hesitation standing in your truth and sharing that truth with all of us. We absolutely support and appreciate each one of you. <laughs>